Hi there, and uh, welcome to my presentation entitled We're Good, They're Bad, Using Language to Exclude. So to start with, I think the title is quite broad, and this presentation is actually really about social media and the exclusionary language that politicians use on different platforms. I'm going to focus here on Facebook, but some of it comes from Twitter and others from other sources such as newspapers. I think that we've all heard or read a lot about populism recently. We hear about Trump, we hear about Brexit in the UK, Polish politics as well. We see a lot of news and we see a lot of discussion about this concept of populist language or populist rhetoric. But I think that the term is relatively misunderstood. And what I want to do today is to kind of start with trying to understand what populism is and then move towards how populism is done on social media and how it's used to exclude people from outside the nation state or from outside the community. Part of this research actually comes from the Demos project, which is a Horizon 2020 funded EU project, uh, which is looking at democratic efficacy and political engagement. Uh, we did quite a lot of research on populist actors on Facebook last year for the uh, European parliamentary elections. And so I'm going to be using some of that material here. And, and a lot of the other material comes from other research that I've published and some other um, memes that I've picked up over the last couple of days. So what I'm going to look at today is really a, a couple of things. I want to start with looking at populism and communication and how populism can be understood and communicated. I then want to look at social media and populism and I'm going to try and show, hopefully clearly, uh, how social media is used by populist actors and how there's a relationship between social media and, and populism. And then bringing it back to language, I'm going to try and show some of the linguistic strategies that we use. And by this I mean some of the words, some of the phrases, some of the arguments that we make when we exclude and when we try and include as well, because we need to understand that whenever we're doing some form of exclusion, there's work being done on inclusion. It just really depends on whom we're including and whom we're excluding. To start with, let's talk about populism. And I think that we need to start with, with what it is. Like I said, to start with, that it's, um, it's a bit of a, a misunderstood term. It's best understood, I think, as what we can call a thin ideology, um, which means that rather than it being a political ideology, such as, for example, communism or socialism or even neoliberalism or fascism, we attach populism to other ideologies and political persuasions. And that means that actually we can have right-wing populism or we can have left-wing populism. So with right-wing populism, we can see the Law and Justice Party in Poland, or we can see Trump, or to some extent we can see uh, the UK Independence Party in the UK and, and the Leave campaign for Brexit. But on the left wing, we can also see left wing populism, such as Jean-Luc Mélenchon in France, uh, Podemos in Spain. And although their individual policies might be very different, the way that they use the people is really uh, at the core of of their business, as it were, or it's the core of their, the way that they, they sell their, their policies. And so really we're talking about a centering of the people. And the people are placed in an antagonistic relationship to other groups. So we can see from here, we have an us on the inside and we have a them on the outside. And, and it's this sort of um, antagonistic relationship that we look at in populist studies when, when we study uh, populism and really how the people are centered. Now we can have different types of um, populism depending on the whether it's left wing or right wing, for example. So we will start with the people. Horizontal populism is a populism that places the people in antagonistic relationship with the elites. We can have political elites, or we could have non-political elites, such as the media or other institutions, such as the European Union. And then a horizontal populism is what we would call an exclusionary populism, and it represents the people in antagonistic relationship to others. So these could be internal others, such as minorities. One thing we can see in Poland at the moment is um, the representation of 
the LGBT community as they are being other, they are set as internal others from the rest of the people, the majority of the people, as it were. But we can also can have external others, such as other nationalities, migrants, um, and such like. So here's an example of anti-elite populism. So this would be the vertical populism. Uh, this is a, a picture from the Daily Express uh, regarding ignore the will of the people at your peril. This was uh, regarding the highest court in the UK uh, deciding on whether Brexit needed to be decided through parliamentary um, route rather than it could be decided by a government. So here we have the people being the, the, the community that needs to be listened to. And then here's an example of exclusionary populism on the other side. So here we have Nigel Farage, the former leader of uh, the UKIP party and now the leader of the Brexit party. Uh, and this is him in front of his now infamous poster uh, during the election, during the Brexit campaign, um, saying that the EU is a breaking point because of migration. Now, as I work with language and, and, and discourse and within linguistics, I understand populism as then a type of communication. Uh, so like I said, it's not an ideology per se. I've written elsewhere that we can understand it as a repertoire of performative and linguistic strategies. And what I mean by this is that it's a, it's a useful set, or maybe toolkit is another word, um, for populist politicians to use. So what they're saying might change, so the actual, the, the, the others might change, or the, whether it's horizontal or uh, vertical populism, that this really is almost irrelevant. But they have a certain way of talking, and they use a certain, should we say, set of props. Um, and this is relatively stable within different national examples, and I'll, I'll be giving some later. Some populist rhetoric or populist rhetoric can be characterized by lots of different what we would call lexical manifestations, or for want of a better word, the presence of certain words and phrases. One thing that we might see is the simplicity of the, uh, of the words used. They're not using complex phrases or sentences. They would use quite simple constructions. Another one is a directness as well. So uh, not maybe using normal uh, concepts of politeness, which we, again, very much see in, uh, in uh, Donald Trump's use of language. We also have a lot of use of colloquial language, and this is something that, that Nigel Farage is quite well known for. Um, and this is a way of trying to create some form of relationship or affinity with, with the people that they're trying to convince, as it were. And they would also use, quite often they would use fallacious appeals to common sense. For example, ad hominem attacks. So rather than attacking the policy, they will attack the person. Um, or ad populum attacks, which is essentially saying that the people say it, so it must be true. This has no basis of uh, whether it's a good or bad policy or uh, whether it would be the right way forward. But this is a way of trying to argue and convince and persuade. Populist uh, actors also use symbolic actions and performances. Um, and what do I mean by this? Well, they could use, for example, different props, like I said, what Billig from 1995 has called this banal nationalism, for example, flags, um, or other cultural markers. I'd like to give two examples here. The first is from Poland. Um, now, this, is, this was a symbolic, we can call this a symbolic action, by Mojej Przepolska, who are a right-wing youth fascist organization. Um, and here we have them putting anti-smog masks on statues around the country as a form of protest against bad pollution in the cities. The statues that they put them on were of famous Polish poets of uh, people from literature, from politics. So they had an idea about who to, who to put these masks on. It was a well-chosen, it was a symbolic action. It was essentially saying that our culture is being choked by pollution. Another one we have, and uh, unfortunately a constant refrain through this 
uh, presentation will be the presence of this man. Um, and here we have Nigel Farage on a TV show, on a, on a debate, and he is showing his British passport. He shows his British passport to say that it says that it's a European passport and not a British passport. We should be getting a British passport back. Now, I don't know about you, but most people don't walk around with their passports in their pockets. So we can pretty much have a guess that this was something staged. Okay? He also did it in a, on another of, a number of other occasions. So we can see that this is part of his performative repertoire. One thing to also say is that, especially when we talk about right-wing populist politicians, is that they intentionally provoke scandals by violating publicly accepted norms. Again, Donald Trump is a very good example of this. He will say something that is intended to shock. And then we have this cycle of scandal, so it's picked up by the mainstream media. It's then denied by the other person, by, by the original speaker. They then may refine the scandal, and so then it becomes, the next stage from this would be the victimhood. For example, my right to free speech is being cancelled or is being impinged. So what we have is this, what uh, Ruth Vodak has called this right, populist uh, perpetuum mobile. So you've got this constant cycle of scandal, denial, more scandal, and then victimhood. The claims and the actions become bigger on the media, and however negative, the visibility of the party becomes wider. It's enhanced, and it ends a further. This whole idea of doesn't really, you know, any type of advertising is good advertising, okay? because you're getting your name out there. And this, I think, kind of links us on to populism and social media. Now, populism, sorry, now social media is a relatively new site of, of discourse, so it's a new site of communication um, in terms of it being a form of communication for politicians. Twitter is the main one or was the main one for the elites, but now Facebook is also used quite a lot and in most countries politicians will have Facebook uh, profiles and use them extensively. In fact, what we find is that it's right-wing uh, populist politicians and actually left-wing populist politicians as well that are the people leading the drive for using social media. Part of this is about an argument that populists make about an exclusion from mainstream media. So they would say that we can't get our voices on mainstream media, so we need to find alternative means to talk to the population. We need to find an alternative public space. It's a different message. It's a question of access. It's also seen as being bottom up as well. So it's using a form of communication closer to the people rather than elite media, as we see with Trump and as we see with Nigel Farage and as we see in Poland as well. The media is often criticized as being biased or fake or leftist or liberal. Okay? Using social media can be a way of saying we're closer to the people. And what happens is with social media is that your message is what we call unmediatized. It's direct. No one is quoting it. It's going direct to the, pe the people. However, I think this claim that populist politicians uh, give is a bit of a misnomer. It's a bit of a, um, a, bit of a red herring. Because new research suggests that actually this is, claim, this is a claim of populist rhetoric rather than actual reality. Because what we have is, going back to what Ruth Vodak writes, this perpetual mobile, that actually they use social media to get access to mainstream media. So even this claim of being excluded from media and having to use social media is untrue. We also see research that shows that they are quite happy to use mainstream media if it backs up their claims. So we can say instead that there's really a symbiotic relationship with mainstream media that uh, they use social media to get to mainstream media. And we can see that, for example, memes and other internet forums uh, will start on the far right and in the, what we might even, maybe not the dark web, but on, on forums that are often banned by major servers. And they'll then move to more mainstream spaces and then they become picked up by these actors. 
Another reason why I think that we can say that social media has a good link to populism is that it allows for a specifically visual element. So visual media has allowed for this personalization of politics with a popular focus on how actors and especially party leaders perform. Now it's all about being able to look good. It's about being able to deliver a good message and do so in a visually attractive way. As I mentioned previously, we have these scandal-friendly uh, elements of right-wing populism, what we might call tweet storms or Twitter storms. So it gets picked up by the traditional press and through these various feedback loops, it reaches a much wider audience. It's also massively cost-effective as well. You don't need much of a um, budget to be able to use social media to start off with. Another really interesting reason why I think social media is, is used by populists and useful for populists and therefore is an extremely interesting space for analysis is that it's a space for what we can call recontextualization. So by this I kind of I kind of mean that you have a text or an image that is taken out of one context and it's changed to give a different message or so it can be understood in a different way. Essentially it's a way of shaking up, or questioning or reinterpreting what's originally said. Now, the example I want to give now is a very recent one. For those of you that have been following, there were protests uh, in Poland recently um, regarding uh, women's rights and also LGBT rights as well. So here we have a poster for the um, march, the Independence March on the 11th of November, Poland's Independence Day. It's a march that is seen by some as a as an expression of patriotism, and by others it's seen as a, an extreme form of nationalism. And it often ends in, in violence, as it did this year as well, including attacks on LGBT um, well, the, the people uh, hanging flags out from their flats. So in this first one, we have on the top, it says, Our civilization, our rules, I suggest. Um, and we can see that the, the, the hour, so Nasha, is in red, the Polish red and white. We have also the main image is of a, a Polish hussar. And the hussar were a Polish heavy cavalry in the 17th and 18th century. Um, and, sort of, and the wings here are in the Polish national colours. Here we've got another image of what the hussars looked like originally. So here we have a hussar, and he is planting his sword through the flag, through an LGBT flag. So it's not a very, it's not a very subtle um, a poster. But here we have one that recontextualizes it. So rather than our civilization, our rules, we've got tolerance and socialism will beat Polish nationalism. And the flags have been rearranged. So we have the rainbow flag as the wings on the soldier's back. And he is planting his sword into the flag of Mojewska Polska, this right-wing fascist organization that is part of the organization, part of the, part of the organizing committee for the, for the independence march. And then we've got this third one, and I'm still not sure, having looked at it, how to understand it. What we have is an image of uh, John Paul II and a huge rock throwing it onto the LGBT flag again. And so I think it's less easy to grasp or decode, and I'll tell you why. First of all, I think that one reading of it could be that religion will defeat bad liberal tendencies. Okay. And on the other hand, it could be seen as ruin, uh, that religion is ruining our lives. Okay. So I think what it means is here, what we could understand it here, is that it depends on the sender and the receiver of the message. We don't know who created this meme or who recontextualized this meme. But we can see here from left to right three different uh, versions of the same image, as it were. And this then gets spread on social media as a way of showing exclusion. So just to summarize the theory before we move on to sort of the language side of things, it's just worth reiterating that the way that social media functions and operates uniquely allows for populist policies, policies and language to be communicated. So I don't think that it's just this question of populism and social media being this um, 
unbreakable bond, but I do think that there's something there about social media, the way it operates, that helps pol political uh, language, that helps uh, populist language. Okay, so how can we analyze such language? Going back to um, actually the close to the beginning, if you remember, we had this them and us, okay? And what language does, or through language, it's these barriers, it's this exclusion that's the, the, that is manifested. And this is really done in four ways. I'm using here Van Dyck's ideological square, which is, a, I think, quite a, a useful, straightforward way to, to explain how it's done. We can emphasize our good actions and traits, and we can mitigate our bad ones. And on the other hand, we can mitigate their good actions, and we can emphasize their bad actions. One of these four strategies will occur when it comes to exclusion. Okay? So we're either making ourselves look better, or we're making them look worse, essentially. And we can do this in lots of different ways. The first one we can do it is really through the, the nouns and the adjectives that we use. So, so the, 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 how we um, discursively construct something and the values that we ascribe to it. So here, Polishness. This is from uh, Peace's um, uh, Facebook page from May 2020. Polishness is freedom. Polishness is solidarity. Polishness is normality. So here we've got a, a, an explanation, or here we've got an example of actual inclusion, actually, but of a populist inclusion, and we'll see why. Secondly, we have um, from uh, Erdogan in Turkey. Thank God, we are the members and sons of a nation with grandiose richness in spirit and in heart. And finally, from Izabegovic in Bosnia, here, great workers, great warriors, good Bosniaks, and humble Muslims live in Genitza. All of this really is a way of essentially emphasizing our positive traits. But it can be used to reduce or mitigate, sorry, to, 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 uh, to focus on the negative traits of those people on the outside. And here we have two other good examples. The first is maybe a, a form of political exclusion. And here we have the communists, the liberals, and the generation of 68 are those who attack Christianity. This is from Sol Shemen from um, Hungary. And this, this is one of my um, favorite ones that I use quite often. This is from Witold Wojtykowski, um, who was the Polish foreign minister uh, a couple of years back. So, we only want to heal our country from certain diseases. Now here, I think it's very interesting that he uses diseases as a construction. Because okay? then he goes on to list what he sees as diseases. We therefore have this metaphor of the nation as a body. Okay? And we need to take certain actions to eradicate this disease. So, we start again. We only want to heal our country from certain diseases. The previous government implemented a leftist ideology, as if the world had to move on in only one direction, towards a mixture of cultures and races, a world of cyclists and vegetarians, who only focused on renewable energy sources and which combats all forms of religion. It has nothing to do with traditional Polish values. So he was a member of peace, the Law and Justice Party. So if we then, we can take this first quote from the previous page, Polishness is freedom, Polishness is solidarity, Polish is normality, to vegetarians and cyclists and leftists and people with who like renewable energy and which don't like religion become diseases. So we have this inclusion and we have this exclusion. Another way is through tense and modality. So tense would be whether we're using past or present or future, and modality would be um, the, 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 the strength of what's going to happen. So we could use a modal verb such as will or should or need or ought to. So here what we find is that, especially right-wing populists, will focus on the future, actually. They can either focus on the future in two ways. One, by saying that if you don't do what I'm saying, then bad things will happen. Or you can say, if you do do it, then great things will happen. Okay, so it's almost a carrot and stick approach. The first one we've got um, is, is from Andre Babish, who's uh, from Czech Republic. I'm happy that you'll, you will be a proud Czech because our country is indeed marvelous and strong in Europe and it will be even stronger. Again, so this is showing the future. Another one we've got, again, unfortunately Nigel Farage comes back again. 
Immigration will be the defining issue of the EU referendum. We must leave the EU and control our borders. Here we have a strong modal verb, must. It's something that needs to be done, otherwise bad things will happen. And this would be an example where a lot of these strategies that I've just shown gets used in one sentence, because obviously when we're talking about communication, it's messy. It's not as if we can analyze it by saying, well, in this sentence, they only use nouns and adjectives. And in this sentence, we're only going to use, uh, we're only going to look at the verbs. Language is messy, so we have to understand what we're, uh, what we're reading by looking at more than one sentence. This is from David Cameron uh, in an um, interview with ITN News from June 2015 during the uh, refugee crisis. In, in Europe. Look, this is very testing. I accept that because you've got a swarm of people coming across the Mediterranean, seeking a better life, wanting to come to Britain, because Britain has got jobs, it's got a growing economy, it's an incredible place to live, but we need to protect our borders by working hand in glove with our neighbours, the French, and that's exactly what we're doing. Again, we can go back to uh, different types of metaphors, and here we've got this metaphor of a swarm. Now, I don't know about you, but nothing ever good came of a swarm, whether it's a swarm of bees or a swarm of spiders or a swarm of hornets. All of these things have what we would say a negative semantic load. Okay? If we were going to look it up using corpus linguistics, swarm would be used normally for poisonous uh, animals, flying animals. And so if we're then representing people in such a way, we understand them in such a way. They are a nuisance. They need to be swatted away. They need to be dealt with. To go to an extreme, they need, we need to bring in pest control. So we've got, first of all, some type of exclusion. Then we have an inclusion. Britain's got jobs. It's got a growing economy. It's an incredible place to live. And then we move to action. We need to protect our borders, and that's exactly what we're doing. A third way where we can uh, sort of create these inclusion and exclusion is through telling stories and making myths. And these are the myths that uphold our nations, the myths that we, a lot of us, believe in. For example, Chris Grayling, who is a conservative MP. Britain has always been a good citizen in the world. We rightly provide a safe haven for people fleeing political persecution by brutal, brutal not beautiful, brutal regimes. So here he's representing Britain as some, as here as a person, as a good citizen, who does good things and providing safe haven. Some people might believe this, but if we actually look at migration policy in the UK from the turn of the 19th, 20th century all the way through, what we actually have is a history of Britain turning people away. And it continues to this day where just now we have um, a father is being arrested for steering a boat towards Britain from uh, France, and in which actually his son died in. So this whole concept of Britain being a good citizen and providing a safe haven somehow jars with the reality that is actually on the ground. But it's a story that Britain tells itself, okay? just like it's a story that Britain tells itself about colonialism. And here's another one from the Polish Defence League, which is a far-right organisation here. It's you, Muslims, for 1400 years have been insulting our religion. You'll have such a jihad in the country like the one Jan Sobieski made outside Vienna. So this was reference to when a Polish-led army of the Holy Roman Empire beat the Ottoman Empire outside Vienna. Um, but again here, we are using Muslims as outsiders. It's an exclusion. So here we have a claim that Muslims, Islam, is not. there's no place for it in Poland. And we also have a few other strategies of self-representation and what we can maybe look at as a denial of exclusion, which is an important part of exclusionary strategies. For example, you might hear, it's not racist, it's just nature. And what happens in this form of claim is that racism is denied because it's in inequality or, for example, black people uh, not being as good at something, or uh, people from Africa not being able to do something, or not being clever, is represented as nature, and nature cannot be questioned. Mm -hmm. If something is natural, it's part of the natural order. 
It can't be argued about. Okay, so racism is something that can be argued, but nature isn't. The second one is that we can say it's not racist because Islam is a religion. Okay. So how can I be racist if I'm talking about Islam? Well, this again sort of speaks to a very limited understanding of what racism is and, and a lot of research on, on race now, I think, generally accepts that we can have a, a dereferentialized idea of, of race that can speak about Islam as a culture, but it can still be racism because what we have actually, although generally speaking, we do not have racism per se quite often. In, especially in mainstream media or even in social media, what we do find is that we have the same phrases, the same claims being made, but again, the targets are somewhat different. So here, Islam is the target, but the same toolkit, again, is something that's there. Another one we might hear, if a, uh, a terrorist attack is carried out by a, an American, a white American, the killer becomes a lone wolf. But if we have a terrorist attack or an Islamic terrorist attack, especially a homegrown terrorist attack, then the rhetoric becomes, well, Islam is a religion of hate, it's a religion of murder, etc. What happens is essentially is that we could call this the, the bad apple argument, that one bad apple spoils the whole group, as it were, the, the whole batch of apples. So here it's one person does something bad, and therefore we take their actions, their words, as a represent as representative of a much wider group. And here it's the outside group quite often. Where if it's, whereas if it's one of our own, in inverted commas, then it becomes a one-off approach because then we are going back to what Van Dyke would say: we're mitigating. And then finally, what we have is one that I think a lot of us maybe have come across in our everyday interactions or what we might find on a lot of, I don't know, television phone-in shows or radio phone-in shows or on social media. And it's this one. And I love this meme because it just works so well. We've got the but there. And the but, as we say, is doing a lot of work. Okay. We have the I'm not racist, but. And we can tell but with this but, this sort of conjunctive, that it moves the sentence towards actually that something is likely to be very racist. Okay? But we have a denial of racism there. Because people understand that socially, racism is a bad thing. So they don't want to be seen as racist, despite holding racist views. Even the most ardent racist that you find on social media, or a lot of the most ardent racists that you would find on social media, not all of them maybe, um, would say that they're not racist. But something else. It's just nature. It's culture. That's something else. Okay, so to con con conclude, how can we really uh, bring this all together and look at how social media excludes and how it's used by populists? One of the problems with looking at right-wing populism on social media is that researchers and also oversight lags behind the reality of use. We are, as researchers, far behind where populists and right-wing and even terrorists and um, all types of um, users of social media are. Very few people are doing, for example, um, academic research on TikTok. Okay? But TikTok, we know, is being used by right-wing groups in America as a way of getting towards or getting access to teenagers. Oversight is also another issue because we need to think about the role of social media platforms. How much do they allow free speech? Some allow free speech, some don't allow free speech. We've seen during the, per the American elections, actually, that Twitter, and I think Facebook as well, has been flagging up information if it seems to be questionable. But this is something relatively new. And social media platforms need to become more engaged, or we could ask them to be. Another thing to remember is that although social media landscapes in different countries, or there are different media landscapes in different countries and for different demographics. So in one country, Facebook might be used more and Twitter might be used more. In other countries, social media isn't used by, political, by populist politicians. For example, Lithuania, we found. But what we do see is that throughout the world, we have this successful playbook or toolkit, which is copied by others. 
Trump, law of justice in Poland, Matteo Salvini in Italy, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Duterte in the Philippines, to some extent also the Leave campaign for Brexit, they are using the same phrases, they're using the same approaches. In some cases, they're actually talking to each other. For example, in uh, Salvini and a lot of other uh, right-wing populists in Europe are cross-posting on Facebook. Despite them being very anti-European, they have quite a good connection with other anti-Europeans throughout Europe. And just to maybe reiterate as well, something that I brought up earlier, that the targets of exclusionary language change over time and from location to location. But these frames, this emphasis of our good actions, this mitigation of our bad, of mitigation of our bad actions and the emphasis of their good actions, the frames remain the same. So we can use such a, a, a framework to actually really understand and show the linkages across the world. And I'll finish there. Thank you very much. If you would like to contact me, if you have any questions, feel free to do so on social media or you can email. Thank you.